Okay, now we're going to move on to part two of the first lecture. And in this uh, part two, our whole goal is to basically figure out how can we determine how many carriers we have in terms of carriers being electrons or carriers being holes. And specifically, how can we calculate the concentration of those. And so to begin with, the first thing that we need to know is, you know, not how many carriers we have, but how many possible energy states exist that those carriers could occupy. Because remember, when we built up our band diagrams, it was all based on the number of energy levels in a silicon atom. So the first thing we need to know again is how many energy states are available. Well, we begin then with something called the effective density of states. Okay? And the effective density of states is, in this course, is a number that we can calculate which tells you how many states are available to fill with electrons or with holes. And for electrons, it's in the conduction band, and for holes, it's in the valence band. If you look at it um, in, re in a uh, real semiconductor, it's not just a number, but rather it's a mathematical function that looks something like this. And so let's first focus on here. Here's the conduction band, okay? And as you can see here, each of these little dots is an available state that an electron could potentially occupy. So as I go further away from the conduction band, you can see the number of available states increases. Going down to the valence band, you have something similar. As I go further away from the valence band, the number of states increases. So if I wanted to plot that graphically, I would basically use this plot here over here to the left here, where I have energy on this axis, and you can see as I go increasing number of states, I'm further away from the conduction band edge. Again, increasing number of available states, you can see here I'm going to higher and higher energy levels on the energy axis. Same thing for the valence band. More states exist further away in energy from the valence band edge. Okay? And in this course, again, we don't want to use the mathematical function because that's a little bit more complicated, so we actually use the effective number, hence the term effective density of states, which we can calculate as follows, and that simplifies the mathematics for us. So this effective density of states is more like an average, you could say. Now, the second thing we need is to know, well, what is the probability of filling those states? So if we now know the number of states we have, well, what is the probability that we will fill them? And that is a critically important concept in this course called the Fermi distribution. If we have this in addition, that's all we need. And so I'm going to use something I call the ping-pong ball analogy here to describe the, uh, the Fermi energy and the Fermi distribution. And so let's assume that I have here a tube that's filled with ping-pong balls. So here's all the ping-pong balls down here. Okay? Now, Let's assume that if the ping pong, balls go, ping pong balls go higher, gravity will want to bring them back down. So the higher they go up, I will call this increasing energy, right? So if, according to MGH, the higher I go up, it takes more energy. Now, let's look at the probability of finding ping pong, ball, ping pong balls for, at zero Kelvin, meaning I have no energy applied to this system. Well, we know that if we had this system at absolute zero, then down here, my chances for finding ping pong balls is 100%, right? It's just filled with ping pong balls. So at every energy level, I find a ping pong ball. So if I were to plot this versus energy, and this is my probability, or my Fermi distribution probability, then you can see my probability is 1.0 or 100% below this point here called E sub F, okay? And that's my Fermi energy point. Now, if I go above E sub F up here, you can see I have no ping pong balls, so my probability drops to zero. So it's a very simple function that shows me how this works. Now, a key point that we have to remember throughout this course is that the Fermi energy is the point at which we have a 50% chance to find an electron or a ping pong ball, in this case, in this description. Okay, And so if I have 100% chance here and 0% chance here, the 50% chance point is right between them, okay? Now, let's look at the more interesting case, which is 300K here, room temperature, where we'd be operating a semiconductor, and you need to bear with me because I know at 300K, if you had ping pong balls in a tube, they're not going to start to bounce around, but assume that 
you know, at room temperature, they're getting a little bit of energy and they're bouncing around, and, and let's just, just go with that analogy. So I've applied energy to the system, and the ping pong balls are starting to move back and forth. They're bouncing up and down a little bit. And what happens now is some of the ping pong balls get enough energy to go to higher states here. And so now when I start to plot this, my Fermi distribution has changed a bit. The first way it changes is before my probability was 100% all the way up to the Fermi level. Now, as you get closer to the Fermi level, it do drops a little bit below 100% because some of the ping pong balls that were here have now moved up top and left behind the absence of a ping pong ball. Furthermore, before when I went above the Fermi level, I had 0% probability of finding a ping pong ball. Well now I've got some that are bouncing up here and so my probability is no longer zero. It's greater than that. So it's a small percentage but it's greater than that. Now the next thing we need to look at and consider is that it is pretty unlikely that I'll get enough energy for a ping pong ball to go way up here, right? And so what you can see here is my probability of finding ping pong balls further and further up here decreases exponentially with energy. So, if I look at the actual Fermi distribution equation here, the probability function, which I used in both the 0k and 300k cases, is calculated as 1 over 1 plus this exponential. And if you look in the exponential, you've got the energy level that you're at, looking for a ping pong ball, or in our case, an electron, minus the Fermi energy, E sub f, divided by kT, which is Boltzmann's constant and the temperature applied. Now, at 300k, or at 0k, for instance, at 0k, you have 1 over 0. So that makes whatever's up top here infinitely strong in terms of the exponential. Okay, And so as soon as, basically, your energy is below e sub f, e less than e sub f, this becomes negative. I end up with negative number over 0, which is negative infinity. And then I end up 1 plus 0, and I get 1 over 1, which gives me just 1. Okay? As soon as the energy goes above E sub f, E greater than E sub f, this becomes slightly positive, and I get a slightly positive number divided by zero, which gives me positive infinity. This goes to infinity, I get one over infinity, which gives me a probability of zero, okay? At 300k, I don't have this one over, k, one over infinity um, factor here in, in the uh, exponential. And so as the temperature increases, you start to see this exponential appear and it starts to broaden out more and more. So if I were to go to higher temperatures, my Fermi distribution would start to broaden out even more and more and more and more. Okay? So this would be increasing temperature. And that kind of that makes sense mathematically looking at the equation, but it also makes sense in terms of what we're what we're describing here, that as I apply more energy, I'm going to see ping pong balls going up to higher energy states. So I expect to see a higher probability at higher energies, okay? And furthermore, I expect to see a lower probability down here because I'll have more absences of ping pong balls as well down here as temperature increases, okay? And so that's a good description of the Fermi distribution. So let's take density of states, Fermi distribution, and combine them here on the next slide. So what we're doing now to calculate our carrier concentration in terms of number of electrons and number of holes, I just multiply the effective density of states times the Fermi distribution. And I'm showing that here graphically. We'll do the actual calculation a little bit later, but let's look at that graphically. So again, here's density of states, and this is for electrons in the conduction band. So places electrons could occupy in the conduction band. Going further away from the, from the, um, from the conduction band edge, I get a higher number of states. And so if I were to look at the product here to begin with, I would see that here's this curve here, it's like this, that is showing me an increasing number of states. But you notice it doesn't keep increasing the number of electrons, it goes back down for some reason. Well the reason why it goes back down is this, this is multiplied by the Fermi distribution which exponentially decreases with distance from the conduction band. And so I have density of states that's increasing, but then I have Fermi distribution, which is exponentially decreasing the number of electrons as I go to higher energies. So density of states, and then Fermi distribution kicks in as I go to higher energies. Okay? I can apply the same thing to holes, 
and it works out quite nicely because every time I generate an electron, which had enough energy to go from the valence band up to the conduction band, I create a hole, right? And so if you look at this case, here's my density of states for holes. So as I go further away, more holes. But then here's my Fermi distribution. As I go further away, my Fermi distribution for finding an electron goes to 100% which means if I have an electron, I don't have a hole, right? Remember, a hole is the absence of an electron. It's a silicon atom that is missing an electron. So if my probability goes to 1 for finding electrons in these energy states, it means I have no holes. And so you see increasing number of states in this direction, density of states for holes. And then you basically see the number of holes decreasing because of Fermi distribution, because because essentially you're having electrons with all those um, with all those silicon atoms, okay? So let's ask ourselves a couple questions here. What would this look like at 0k, 300k, and 500k? Well, we've covered that on the previous slide. At 0k, the difference would be like this, right? And as a result, you would have no electrons and no holes. This is 300k here. If you went to 500k, you would basically get even more broadening of the Fermi distribution. And as a result, I would get more electrons and I would get more holes appearing, which makes sense. You have more energy applied to the system, higher temperature. You have more thermal generations of electrons with enough energy to come up here and become electrons and leave behind positively charged holes. Okay? So the question at this point is, are we done? Well, the answer is no, we're not done because this is for an intrinsic semiconductor where the electron and hole densities are equal. However, you will find that in all the devices we do in this course, we require something called PN junctions, where we have one type of material that is, has more holes or is P-type, the other type has more electrons and is N-type, and then if you look at BJTs, FETs, and LEDs, they're all based on PN junctions. And so we need to alter the concentrations so that they're non -equ not equal here by doping and this requires doped semiconductors. So, how do we dope a semiconductor to alter the balance or the, the, the balance between the number of holes and the number of electrons? Well, remember that silicon here is in column four. So I'm sitting here in column four, okay, in the periodic table, and next to silicon, of course, then is column three. Sorry, I'm trying to draw a three there best I can. Let me erase that and do another attempt at, at drawing column three. And then next to that, you've got column five, okay? So remember that silicon bonds covalently to achieve its outer shell eight by taking its four outer shell electrons and sharing one of them with an adjacent silicon atom. So if you have four silicon atoms with four valence electrons, each sharing one atom with an adjacent silicon, they all think they have eight, and they've done what they think they like to do by chemistry, which is have a full outer shell, right? Well, when we do doping, what we do is we apply, we include, for example, a little bit of boron mixed in with the silicon. So what I do is I put boron in the silicon lattice, and I force it to bond just like the silicon would. However, the difference is, is that boron is a column three element. It has one less electron than silicon in its outer shell. Therefore, if boron is going to covalently bond and share electrons in silicon just like silicon did, the only way it can do that is if it, if it has four valence electrons. And because it only starts with three valence electrons, what the boron does is it basically goes to a silicon next to it and it steals an electron from that silicon to give it four so that it can bond in the silicon just like silicon. Now, what that does is two things. First off, as soon as the boron steals an electron, it becomes negatively charged, which makes sense because boron itself start, starts as charge neutral, right? You have just as number of protons as you do electrons. More importantly, what happens here is as boron stole an electron from an adjacent silicon, it created a hole. Remember, a hole is the absence of an electron in silicon. And so now that silicon is carrying a positive charge, which it could trade from silicon to silicon back and forth around here. And now I've created a moving charge, that, a charge that could be moved by doping, 
I mean moved by electric field by doping this with boron. So when we draw this in this course, p-type doping, which means more holes than electrons, will look like this. First I have these circles here that have a negative symbol inside of them. These here are the boron atoms. Okay, so when I draw a circle around something in a block of material, that means it is an atom. And so again, every boron had a negative charge. The second thing I have here is a positive charge here, which is the hole that was created as the boron was doped here. It's critically important that we keep track of the boron atoms and the holes. You'll see that as we do PN junctions. Okay? We'll need to, to keep track of both of them because that term determines things like built-in voltage for a PN junction. A key thing to ask ourselves right now, though, is what happens if I apply electric field? Well, if I applied an electric field to try to move the carriers in this direction, what you would see is that the holes can move because they can be traded from silicon to silicon. However, the boron atoms are stuck. They are stuck, bonded in the crystal structure of the silicon. They will not move. So it's very important to remember that the holes created by doping can move an electric field, but the dopant atoms themselves, the boron atoms, they cannot move. They stay still even if you apply electric field. Let's move on to n-type material then. So n-type material will have more electrons than it will have holes. And how we can achieve electron, um, uh, more electrons and n-type doping is to use a column 5 element and put it into the silicon. So in this case I'm going to use phosphorus which has one more electron than silicon. You put the phosphorus in there, it's forced to bond the exact same way in the lattice. The only way it can do that is if the phosphorus tricks itself into thinking it only has four valence electrons just like silicon. And to do that, what the phosphorus has to do is it has to give up an electron to reduce its valence electrons to four and then bond the same as silicon. So what happens there, phosphorus gives up an electron, it becomes positively charged. This electron then is free in the lattice here to move just like a thermally generated electron. So now I've created a charged particle, an electron, which can be moved with electric field. Look at the diagram over here. We have something similar but opposite. First off, I've got these circled things, which I said are always the dopant atoms. These are the positively charged phosphorus atoms. They cannot move in the electric field. Okay. And the second thing I have is for every phosphorus atom, I create an electron, and so I have an electron here. If I applied electric field, I could then move the electrons as desired through the lattice. One thing that's important to note is this system is what we call charge neutral. You'll see this come up a lot in the course. At thermal equilibrium, any system wants to be charge neutral, meaning that the number of positive charges and negative charges cancels out. And so that is true with dopants as well. Now, below here you'll notice that the band diagrams have changed a little bit. For p-type material, you'll see that the Fermi level has shifted down, whereas before it was in the center, right? And you'll notice that for n-type material, the Fermi level has shifted up, where again before it was right here in the center point between the conduction and the valence band. And so the next slide will help us visualize why the Fermi level has to. So, let's come back to and do a bit of review. We said we could calculate for undoped material, which has an equal number of electrons and holes, we could basically get the concentration by multiplying density of states times Fermi distribution, density of states times Fermi distribution, here's density of states, here's Fermi distribution, and I get the number of electrons and holes. So this is for undoped material here. Let's look at n-type doping now. Well, we know that for n-type doping, first off, when we put those phosphorus atoms in there, we get more electrons than we had before. So I've increased the number of electrons. So, the, right off the bat, we know that if the Fermi level is the 50% chance for finding an electron, if I have more electrons up here, then my probability for finding an electron should go closer, shift, or shift up to where most of the electrons are. And so my Fermi level shifts because it's a probability function. It shifts up because I have more electrons here, and so my 50% chance to find an electron is closer to where there are now more electrons. One thing I want to note before I forget here is that 
Just because the Fermi level says I have a 50% chance to find an electron does not mean that there are electrons between the conduction and the valence band. This is called a band gap. Remember, there are no carriers in between the conduction and the, and the valence band. So the 50% chance is just a probability. It doesn't mean it exists there, but it's just basically giving you a probability of how many electrons are down here with the silicon versus how many electrons are up here in the conduction band. Something else has happened here which is interesting as well. Look here, when we had undoped material, we had this many holes, but when we doped this n-type, we have less holes. So what happened? Well, what happened is, is we created all these electrons up here, tons of electrons, okay? And we started off with a couple of holes down here and, and that, were, that were the thermally generated ones. But what happens is when you have more electrons in the conduction band, they can line up with holes in the valence band and start to recombine and wipe them out and reduce the concentration of them. And so you see that your concentration of holes has decreased because you created more electrons by doping, which can match up with holes in the valence band, recombine with them, an electron goes back to the silicon atom, kills a hole, and therefore my hole concentration down here in the valence band has been decreased. Let's move on to n-type or p-type material down here. So for p-type material I use boron atoms and the boron atoms increases my number of holes compared to where I started with for undoped material and it's with just thermally generated carriers. And as I expect, I put boron atoms in, I get more holes and lo and behold look what happens here. The electron concentration has now decreased because I created all these many more holes, right? And I started with a few electrons that were thermally generated, but because I have so many holes down here, they easily find electrons to recombine with and they reduce my electron population down. The Fermi level also the Fermi level also shifts. So, let's think about this, okay? If I have reduced the number of electrons here, then my, that means that if I reduce the number of electrons, there's less probability to find an electron up here. So my 50% point is down here where I have all those electrons still sitting with the silicon atoms themselves. So the Fermi level has to shift down in this case. The beauty of this is for n-type and p-type material, this shifting of the Fermi level, when you look at this function times this function, gives us the same prediction of the uh, increase in either of these humps as you change the doping. I'll show you more of that on the next slide. Okay? A couple terms before we go on to the next, the next slide. So one of the terms that's important is n naught and p naught, and the naught means at thermal equilibrium, meaning that you put, the, you put the semiconductor on a table, you don't do anything to it. You, it's just sitting there at room temperature, you're not applying electrical current or anything to it to alter it, it's at thermal equilibrium. Well, n naught is my n-type concentration in undoped material okay, at thermal equilibrium. p naught would be my whole concentration okay, at thermal equilibrium in undoped material. Now, if I have n-type material, I want, I want to know the n-type concentration in n-type material. That would be n sub n, n sub n sub not n, number of electrons in n-type material, and then I have also number of holes in n-type material, which is less than the thermally generated ones. Then I have number of electrons in p-type material and number of holes in p-type material. You need to get used to the, the terminology because we'll be using it uh, frequently in this course. Okay, so let's try to visualize a little bit better why the Fermi level shift um, gives us a higher care of concentration. And so before when I had when I had undoped material, okay, my Fermi distribution was right here in the smack dab in the center, and it went up kind of like this, right? And so it went like this, and it went like this. That's uh, probably my sorry, it's not the greatest drawing, but anyway, it was it was kind of like that. And so what happened as a result for undoped material is that my overlap here area under the curve here and area under the curve here when multiplied or I'm sorry area under the curve here and area under the curve it's very small right and so I got a tiny bit 
of electrons. When this shifts up, my area under the curve here, which I'm filling in here, increases. And as it shifts higher and higher, I get more and more area under this curve, which when multiplied with the area under this curve here, gives me a bigger and bigger concentration. So as the Fermi level shifts up, it also nicely mathematically matches the fact that I should have more and more electrons. And so that's also why the Fermi level should shift. And you could have the, you have the same thing as well. If you have a p-type material, then the Fermi level shifts down, and you can look how the basically the probability you have more of the probability of being less than 100%. Anytime you don't have an electron, probability of less than 100%, that means there's a hole. And so this area here will increase overlap with the density of states here, and you'll start to see your hole concentration increasing as well. So at this point, we're really close to making the build basic building blocks for all semiconductor devices, which is PN junctions. And so let's do a little bit more to, to basically get some calculations together for ourselves. And so Let's assume that um, the entire density of acceptors, like boron atoms, ionize at 300K. So this is an assumption we make in this course, that when you put a dopant into a semiconductor, at 300K there's enough energy for it to ionize and create an electron or a hole. Okay? Well, if we do that, there's a couple things that happen as a result. Okay? First, first off, we will always assume that when we have doped material, that our hole concentration is equal to the dopant concentration. The reason why is that my hole concentration that's thermally generated, or electron concentration, my intrinsic carrier concentration is only 1.5 times 10 to the 10th per cubic centimeter. Okay, So it's pretty low, because when I dope things, I'm typically looking at something that is like, you know, 10 to the 16th, or 10 to the 17th, or 10 to the 15th, it is orders and orders of magnitude greater. And so when I look at the number of holes, it will be dominated by the dopants because the number of dopants is orders of magnitude greater than the thermally generated number of carriers. So that is how I would predict the p-type concentration. I could also predict the p-type concentration by the Fermi distribution, and I could predict the Fermi position and back calculate it from the number of dopants. So if my p-type concentration number of holes is equal to the number of boron atoms I put in there, and I said that my number of holes is equal to density of states times the Fermi distribution, well, let's simplify the Fermi distribution. Here's Fermi distribution. At 300K and where the energies I'm at, we can assume that this is much greater than 1, so I end up with 1 over an exponential, which is just a negative exponential. I put that back in here density of states times the Fermi distribution. And then I could use this, I could give you NA in a textbook, and then you could back calculate the, um, the knowing the energy of the valence band and the energy of the Fermi level to get basically the difference, how far the Fermi energy is shifted away from the valence band. So what is this distance right here? So this equation will now help me do that if I need to do that in some of the lecture notes. Now note, that the maximum carrier concentration you can ever get would be the density of states. So if the Fermi level gets closer and closer to the valence band in this case, the maximum you could get is the density of states, which is about 2 times 10 to the 19th per cubic centimeter. And so you'll be limited by this function as the Fermi distribution goes to a probability of 1. Okay. The other thing that's important to note here is that I can calculate, if I know my number of holes, I can easily and always calculate my number of electrons using the equation n naught p naught equals ni squared, where ni is the intrinsic carrier concentration that is thermally generated for silicon, and p naught is the doped level, and n naught will be the product with that equal to ni squared. So what this says is very simply, in what we saw before, is that if I increase my p-type doping, I get more holes, and if I get more holes, then they recombine with electrons, and my electron population goes down because Ni is a constant. It doesn't change. So again, this beautifully shows us that if I increase one carrier concentration, the other one has to go down because of increased recombination, and again, this is a constant at 300K. It's the thermally generated concentration. 
Some further terms we'll use in this, in this course to describe semiconductors. If we lightly dope something, that would be P minus. If we do normal doping, we'll just say it's P silicon. If it's heavy doping, P plus. And if it's P++, that means it's degenerately doped, meaning that it doesn't even act like a semiconductor that much. It acts more like a metal at that point. Okay? And again, to emphasize, this is how we calculate the number of, of, of holes in P-type material. We could use the exact same equation, altered appropriately for the number of electrons, and use that to calculate the number of electrons using density of states for electrons and the Fermi distribution. But we can also use this simple equation here, substitute Na for P0 into here, and say that n naught of P0 is Ni squared divided by Na. So, again, we're really close to making a PN junction. I give you here, uh, here's a block of P-type material, which in this course will always be colored green, N-type material, which will always be colored red in this course, conduction band, valence band marked with colors, Fermi level closer to the valence band because it's p-type material, Fermi level closer to the conduction band because it's n-type material, and here's a full set of equations you can use to calculate concentrations based on doping levels or shifts in the Fermi distribution. Here's a simple example from the textbook. We dope silicon with 10 to the 17th phosphorus, so this is doping at n-type. So if we dope at 10 to the 17th, well, what's the, the p-type concentration? Well, we know that we can use the equation P0 equals Ni squared over Nd, right? It's just this equation here. Both of these are the same. And here's Ni squared, 1.15 times 10 to the 10th squared gives me this. Here's the doping level for the, and the number of electrons, 10 to the 17th. And I end up with P0 is only like 10 to the 3rd per cubic centimeter. So you can see when you dope this heavily N-type, it kills off a ton of holes by recombination. And, of course, my n-type concentration is just equal to the doping levels. So n naught and nd are equivalent. So you look at this, you say, well, this must be a ton of phosphorus, right? Well, not really. If you look at the percentage of the silicon host, silicon has a density of 5 times 10 to the 22nd atoms per cubic centimeter. And we doped it with 10 to the 17th phosphorus atoms per cubic centimeter, which, when you calculate, is only 0.0002%. So it's a tiny fraction, and we can achieve a tiny fraction of the silicon is doped with phosphorus, and we can achieve a huge skew between the number of holes and the number of electrons. So you can see doping can be a very powerful force in these devices to change their type. So here's the review. Um, again, you should be able to answer these questions in preparation for the quiz, and I look forward to seeing everybody in class.